his path that he could love to Jesus Christ. And, and this morning, uh, we're going to be looking into Scripture to see that as Christians, that we are to love, because we're being loved by an almighty God, and we are to love people around us. And God encourages you and me, his people, to lovingly draw into acquaintances with other individuals and helping them come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's our mission. That's what he called us to do. And moreover, when we begin to love others as God has loved us, we will see that those loving relationships invite people into that relationship with Christ. We really won't have to say much if we're loving them the way we're supposed to love them. The love itself will lead them into no wanting and being curious about how you could do that kind of love. You and I are called to do just that. Last Sunday night in our message that we shared with you, uh, titled Jesus Simplified the Way, we talked about the need in that relationship with God must begin with what Jesus said in Matthew 22, verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, for that is the greatest commandment. And then in verse 39, he goes on to say, and the second is like it. The second is, 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 is close to almost the same. It's similar to the first one. And that is that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. Love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus said that the second great commandment was like the first, similar, close, almost the same. And so that he, what he is saying to you, what he's saying to me this morning is the fact that to love God we can't love him without loving one another. It, 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 it's, it's, it's like peanut butter without the jelly. You don't have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich unless you got the two together. You can't love God and not love your neighbor. However, there are some things we got to understand. And, and I, I want to say this morning, and, and I know this person, I'm going to probably embarrass them. And I'm not talking about my wife. I can't embarrass her. But there are some, let's be honest with one another. Okay? Let's be totally, completely honest with one another. There are some people that are really easy to love. There's some people, their character, their way about them, <laughs> they're just easy to love. Now, I'm back here because I knew he wouldn't come up there. Amen, Gene? <laughs> but, but there are. There are. Ray is, is an easy person to love. You really are, Ray. And I appreciate it. <laughs> See, he's ornery, too. He's ornery. You want to say that a little louder? <laughs> but let's be honest. There's also others that aren't so easy. And I didn't know Angie. I didn't put my arm around you. I love you too. I love you too. But true, come on. Be, be honest with me. You and I know that there are others that aren't as easy to love. But the scripture tells us that the second commandment is like the first. And so if I love God, I've got not only to love the rays of the world, but I got to love the others as well. Yes. That's not a request. That, that is a commandment that you and I are to do. And, and, and so vital Christianity 
takes into account how we treat other people. Do you hear what I'm, you understand what I'm saying? We, we, we really touched a little bit about it in Sunday school class this morning. How I respond to the love of God in my life is a witness to those around me who may not even know me of, of my relationship with him. They may not know that I'm a Christian, but they know I'm different. They understand there's something different about it. And so it's vital to our relationship with God because the world is watching us. And much of the Bible addresses the matter of those interpersonal relationships because loving God means that we are to love people. And because of that, God wants us to witness. He wants us to, to, to be uh, witnesses to our neighbors, to our schoolmates, to, to, to our friends, to our relatives about our relationship with him, our relationship to God. Why? For the express purpose of them accepting and coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and then making them fully devoted followers of Jesus. That's the mission that you and I have been given. That's the mission. But if we love the Lord God, our all mind, soul, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves, that's going to be our mission. We're going to care about their cancer. We're going to care about the sin that is in their lives. Linda, we, I, I, what you said this morning reminded me of Louise Chapman's vision that she had in her book on assignment for God. When she seen in her little in her little uh, 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 sanctuary, if you will, out in the wilderness, and and she seen a vision of people just walking off the cliff and going into a devil's hell, and and there was one right after the other. And the weird thing about it is Jesus is standing right there at the edge of the cliff as they do this. He's watching them do this, and and she goes up to him and said, "Lord, why aren't you saving them?" And he says, "Because that's your job. We need a burden for the people walking into hell this morning." We need a burden for other individuals that, that, that are no longer going to live eternal life, but eternal damnation. People have got to understand, we've got to understand this morning that you're going to live eternally somewhere. The choice is yours. God don't send you to hell. You and I choose whether or not we go to hell. And God doesn't want that in our lives, and so we've got to choose God. We've got to choose the right way. And for the express purpose of that, we need to see people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And if we undertake such a task, we must do so deliberately and intentionally. Hello? You mind if I share what you said in Sunday school class? The cards I've given you, I hope you're handing them out. It's, it can be fearful. It can be something that we put off. It can be, but why? Because of, he was, he, remember, he, his, his beginning of that video, he was afraid to, 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 to do what he knew he needed to do. And, and, and other things can come up and, 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 and interfere with our, us doing that. But my friend, it is our responsibility. It is our need. It is God's task that he's given us. And we have to be deliberate and we have to be intentional in doing it. They're not going to give themselves out by themselves. It's going to take you or I transferring it from our hand to their hand, saying, here is our card. It's our church information. Blenner has a church. We'd love to have you. We're a relaxed, real, and relevant church. We want you to know that you're welcome to come see us. If you've got any questions or anything, then go to truelife.org, and they'll be able to answer maybe some of the questions you have. They have a library full of videos that can help you in that situation. And invite them to church. But here's, here's Paul uh, in, 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 in Scripture. Here's how Paul coaches us to be deliberate, to be intentional. Follow with me, if you will, in verse 25 of chapter 4 through verse 2 of chapter 5. In fact, stand with me this morning. It's not too lengthy uh, this morning. And let's read it uh, together this morning. Chapter 4, starting with verse 25. 
He says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of the, all bitterness and rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just in Christ, as in Christ God forgave you. Verse 5 or chapter 5 verse 1 follow God's example therefore as dearly beloved or dearly loved children and walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God father we thank you for your word this morning use it father to speak to our hearts and to guide us in the way of life today to live a life pleasing to you in Christ's name we pray and amen. Amen. You may be seated. Verse 1 of chapter 5. Again, Paul says, be imitators of God. Therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Paul is saying here in, in these two verses that you and I, we are to be imitators of God. We are to be imitators of God. And the best way that I know to do that and how we should do that, that is to imitate God, it's not by asking the question, WWJD, what would Jesus do? But asking, or maybe better saying, no, what did Jesus do? WDJD. What did Jesus do? And I take credit for that acronym, okay? That's my acronym. Anyhow, to know what Jesus did do means that you and I, since we weren't there in his presence, need to get into his word and learn what he did do, how he did love, the things he did. Anyway, he then tells us to live that life of love, to live a life of love. You and I, my friend, are to reach out and to love those around us, our neighbors, our schoolmates, our, 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 our uh, uh, work uh, uh, co-workers, uh, our, our, our family, our, our enemies. We're, we're to show them love. And, and so the first coaching lesson in the life of love that Paul teaches us is to speak truthfully to your neighbor. Speak truthfully to your neighbor. Therefore, each one, verse 25, therefore each one of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. Honesty is a rare virtue today. Honesty is a rare virtue. In the, in the book titled, The Day America Told the Truth, the polls reveal that 91% of Americans lie regularly. <laughs> it was only a white lie. It, it's still a lie. Well, you don't understand the situation I was in, preacher. I had to, if I, if I told the truth, I, 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 things would have fell apart. It's still a lie. We're taught that little white lies are fine, that situational lies are okay, 
I mean, it keeps you from getting in trouble. It's okay to lie. It depends on the situation, preacher. It, it, you know, if I tell the truth, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> well, my friends, the scripture is quite clear that the liars will go the same place that all the other sinful people go. A lie is a lie. And, and, and we're to be honest. We're to be people who are, are, are telling the truth. To speak honestly is absolutely essential for you and me in our day and time especially. Young people are wanting the truth. Young people don't want to hear or see, I should say, hypocrisy in individuals' lives. They want to know the truth. They want to know what it takes to get to heaven. They want to know the truth about God. And you and I, the scripture tells us that we must put falsehood, put off falsehood and pretense. We must speak honestly. Why? Because it reveals to the others what we are like. If we're imitators of God and we are doing those, we're not honest and we're lying and doing all these other things, we're, we're saying that's what God is. And God is not a liar. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except to me. He is truth. He is the living image of truth. And when you and I claim to be Christians and we find a, and we start being dishonest or cheating or whatever it might be in things of life today, we're saying that's what God is. You and I must speak honestly about our relationship with God. We cannot be ashamed of God. We can't hide it under a table. We can't go about our daily walk with, 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 in the world and, 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 and hide that from the people around it. We need to let that be known. It is our responsibility to share the gospel. It is our responsibility to share our testimony with the world. We don't, I'm not saying you have to understand the, or know the Bible from, from, from Genesis all the way to maps. I'm not saying you've got to do that. But you've got to be able to stand up and tell your testimony about what God did to you on the day that you asked Him in your heart and your life and, and what happened, the experience that, you, that came about and how you were transformed and you're no longer that person. We've got to be able to do that. We've got to be honest. We can't, we can't be ashamed of our faith. Jesus says, or the Word says, that if we're ashamed of Him, He's going to be ashamed of us. Another reason for being honest is that we are a part of one another. And, and, and so if I say, well, I go to the church of the Nazarene down there at Blenner Hassett, and, and, and they see you, you know, witnessing and telling about that, and then they see you living a lie and, and, and being dishonest, they're going to say, well, what a, what a hypocrite church. Not just the individual, you represent the church. You rep not only represent God, but you represent the church. One another, it, 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 plays, it plays a part in all of our lives. And so, honestly, self-honesty is important for good mental health. When, when, I'm not, uh, when I'm not honest with a relationship of mine, a, a parent-daughter relationship, son relationship, a, a husband-wife relationship, friendship, whatever, when I'm not, I mean, there's been many of people's relationships broken and, and, and anxiety and, and all that because people aren't honest. To have a right relationship, we've got to be honest. And, and it plays a part in the mental health of, our, our, of individuals who are not being healthy or honest, and even those that are not being honest too. Be honest. Honest relationships, they make healthy, happy relationships. And so the first coaching lesson that we learn in the life of love from Paul this morning is that you and I are to speak truthfully to our neighbor. And the second one is that we are to share with needy persons. We are to share with needy persons. Verse 28, once again, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work. Boy, that's a good concept. I don't make a living by stealing. I make a living by working. That's a good concept today. 
And then he goes on and says, doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Our world seeks to take from others. I, I can tell you what, I, I can remember in, in more than one situation, people stabbing me in the back to get to the top. God's word teaches us early and often about stealing and how wrong it is. We, we need, we've come to believe not only what is mine is mine, but what is, what is yours is mine. God respects our need to possess, but he encourages us to give. <coughs> As such, the Christian should lovingly seek to meet the needs of others. The reason for working is so that you and I might share with others. Now, some would call that socialism today. And if you were in my Sunday school class, you know that's not what I'm talking about. Socialism is taking what you have and giving it to a government entity and then that government entity doing what it wants with it. Right. <clears throat> this is not what Jesus... Jesus wasn't a part of socialism. Out of love and out of work, we see a need and we meet that need. Not the government. I want to meet the need the way I want needs met. Not turn it over to some separate entity and allow them to do it. That's not socialism. That's me loving God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second, like it, loving you as my neighbor. And what the, the trick of the enemy is to get us to want more for us as we did in the scripture this morning. They were more concerned about their own whole household than they were the things of God. And so they, 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 they built their own houses and left God's out. We need to, we need to understand we got to have our basic needs met, but pray that God gives us more than our basic needs and we help meet the needs of others. And, and see, that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying, work doing something useful with your hands that you may have something to share with those in need. We have to come to believe that what is mine is really God's. And God wants to use it for him. And as Christians, you and I should lovingly seek to meet the needs of other people. That's why we work and do the things we need to do. The Christian who would express his love will give. The Christian is moved by compassion when people have needs. And so the first coaching lesson in the life of love that Paul gives us is that you and I are to speak truthfully to our neighbor. The second one is that we're to work to share with needy persons. And the third one is that we are to build up others. Build up others. Verse 29. Do not let, listen, do not let. That's a command. That's not a request. That's a command. As Christians, the Lord is saying to you a commandment here. He's saying, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. <coughs> but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Let no unwholesome talk come from our mouth. We've talked about this lately. Negativity abounds. It's, dest it's dest destructive. The old saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. I got a Greek word for that, and that's hogwash. 
what we say with our mouth can hurt other people. And because of, of all the social media and the news and the political climate of our nation today, if we're not keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, then it can really be easy to get in that pat, pattern of being critical of others. It's so easy to get online and on social media, uh, Facebook or, or Twitter or, or all those other Snapchat and all those other things. It's easy to hide behind a computer or a, a cell phone and, and type what you feel about somebody and not seeing the results of what it's doing. <laughs> what we say should be to benefit those around us who listen, those who, who pay attention to us and, and make it as a, as a part of life's goal to build people up instead of tearing them down. There is a shortage of encouragement so we need to dispense it little, lib, liberally. We need to give it out as if it's going out of style. In fact, it may be out of style. And again, the first coaching lesson in the life of love is to speak truthfully to your neighbor, to work, to share with the needy person and to build up others. And the fourth coaching lesson in the life of love is that we are to be kind and forgiving. I think to really grasp this point, this coaching lesson, I think we must first listen to why this statement is needed. Going back to verse 31, Paul gives us why it needs to be. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. And with that in mind, I really don't think that anyone would argue with the fact that anger is an emotion. Amen. It is part of our, it's part of who we are. Anger is emotion. But with that in mind, we have to, we, we more than likely got to understand that this is a, this is more than just that emotion. I mean, we all have gotten angry at times, I'm sure. I won't share who it is, but there's been one or two individuals, and I believe with all my heart that they never had a spat with each other in their marriage relationship. And I can't disagree with that because I know these individuals and they live the godly life like you wouldn't believe. But for the majority of us, I, I would say that we have gotten the emotion of anger stirred up in us a time or two. However, this verse that Paul has given us here, the, this caution, he's saying that we need to get rid of that bitterness. Why do I need to get rid of bitterness? If I, I, this happened to Toby early in his Christian walk. I became bitter with someone. They didn't even know it. They were doing things that I didn't think were right in the church. And, and I was I was seeing that this this is keeping people from maybe even coming to church, and I became bitter. But it only affected me, my spiritual walk. It kept me from receiving God's blessings in my life. It got so bad that I finally went to the altar and prayed about it one time and then I apologized to the person for being bitter at them and said, what are you talking? They said, what are you talking about? I had no idea you was that way toward me. Well, it affected me. Get rid of it. We need to get rid of it. I went and got rid of it at the altar. Bitterness, wrath, anger. These, these are meant to the violent inward resentment and displeasure against others. That's what those are. It's more than this, this the emotion. Christians should not entertain these vile passions in their heart, not be glamorous with their tongues. And by malice, we are to understand that rooted anger 
which promotes mankind to design and to be uh, to do mischiefs to others other words I don't get mad I don't get even though Come on. You see, that's what we're talking about here. That's what Paul's talking about. And so we got to understand. We got to understand when that happens that there's a, something got to take place in our lives. You see, to all that, the contrary to all of this is that you and I need to be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. And so we can see here that Paul is adamant about or as to the dangers that that anger going beyond emotion, that anger that brings up bitterness and wrath and, and all those other things, that getting angry, it's dangerous. And he tells us in, in, in no uncertain terms that that is okay and that we need to get rid of it. We do have a choice. Listen to me, because I know you've said it, or I'm almost guaranteed. I know I've said it. I know we've got a choice, folks. We have a choice about being mad. We do. Anger, it says, gives the devil a foothold. Anger gives the devil a foothold. And then it says sustained anger is forbidden. It says in, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And again, we're told to get rid of anger and bitterness, rage, brawling and slander, along with every form of of malice and the burden of responsibility for handling anger is placed squarely upon our shoulders all too often and this is what is where I was going at a little while ago all too often we want to blame someone else for our anger you hear what I'm saying we want to blame someone else for our, you made me mad. You upset me. I couldn't help it. You don't understand how I was raised. We use those statements to excuse the anger in us. These are unacceptable excuses that sustain our selfish agenda and actually impedes the work of God in our lives. You see, I learned quickly while working as a chaplain that a lot of mental problems is because people are holding on to things in their life that weren't very nice maybe and I used to tell them you can't live in that past you got to turn it over to God let go what's it saying let go and let God we got to turn it over we, we can't live in the past and I know a lot of people have been hurt from the past, mentally, physically, sexually, so forth and so on. But if you want healing, you got to forgive and move on. If not, you're going to get defeated. You're not going to have, have, the, have the victory, the healing that God wants you to have in your life. And so it becomes easy for us to say, well, the way you said that made me angry. Our choice is not to get angry or should be not to be angry. And we don't have to go down that road. 
we make the choice not to allow that to affect us. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility. And the gospel cannot be advanced when there are anger, anger and broken relationships. The life that is winsome is kind of is the life that we are kind with and, and compassionate to. That's what brings people to the same saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And love is greatly influenced by how you and I carry that out. Kindness will always be remembered. Love and kindness are godlike qualities, virtues we too must embrace and frequently demonstrate. Apart from kindness and compassion, few people will be saved. Forgive each other. God's people need to be forgiving because if we don't forgive, we cannot be forgiven. And the reason we forgive is because of what Christ done for us. I mean, Barb, almost don't believe your testimony. Because I can't picture you as being a bad girl. <laughs> okay? I just can't. And, and not, every, not everybody. I can remember uh, Reverend Bess getting up and, 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 and testifying. You know, God's grace that brought me out of my sin is the same grace that kept what he said. He didn't point me out, but he says, the grace that saved the sinner from a deep, dark sin is the same grace that kept me from being that sinner. Okay, basically what is said. And so it can't work both ways. But we need to be thankful and remember what God has forgiven some of us for. Because that will make us appreciate how we need to forgive others. And we and, and, and we actually owe a debt of forget forgiveness to our Lord and Savior by just demonstrating that in the way that he wants us to do. And how, how can we expect people to seek the forgiveness of God if we, you and I, if we have not demonstrated God's forgiveness by forgiving other people? How can we expect the saving God? How can we expect them to come to Christ? And again, the first coaching lesson in the life of love is speak truthfully to your neighbor, work to share with needy people, or persons, build up one others, be kind and forgiving. And last this morning is to live lovingly. Going back to verse one and two again of chapter five, be imitators of God. And therefore, dearly loved children, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. We are to be and to live as Christ lived. He met the physical needs of people by healing them. He ministered to the emotional needs of people by comforting them. He addressed the intellectual search of people by describing God to them. He helped them to live a happy, compatible life by coaching or coaching them on marriage, virtues, and even governmental authority. And he gave up himself as a sacrifice. The first time I saw love, Glenda, was on that cross. If it is in the person of Jesus Christ. Everything, my friend, we view the love of Jesus through Jesus, though, although Jesus did not want to die, he did so on that cross. And we need to view everything from what he did for us. Everything inside of Jesus screamed for safety, just as you and I want to be saved. And Jesus was publicly criticized and persecuted. But you and I, we got to be like him. We've got to love our friends to faith. We've got to live a life of godliness and it must be lived out before those around us. We must choose deliberately to shape our lives after the loving life of Jesus. 
to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. To be imitators of God and to live a life lovingly. My friends, it will win people to Christ. Let's love our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, our families. Let's win them to faith in Jesus Christ. That's our commission. That's what we are commissioned to do because of the commandment of loving God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength and our neighbor as ourself. It's not a request. It is a commission. It's a commandment that you and I are to go out and do. Once again, you've heard the message from the Lord this morning. You've heard the gospel today. But there are things that we need to do. And I want everybody once again to take five more cards this morning and have them to hand out. We need to pray over these cards for five people that God would lead into our way that we may have the opportunity to share these with. And, and, and I want you to pray with all your heart like the morning prayer that we heard this morning in the beginning of the message for God to lead someone your way each and every day to where next week you come back and ask me for five more cards that they run out before the end of the week I, I know it can happen church I know as as we, we may not be used to it, but it's like Alan said, God's not done with us. In our Sunday school class, he, you know, we, we've got a nice facility here. Now we've got to fill it. And we do that. And, and they may not come here. I understand that. But we need to minister to anybody that God leads us to. Would you do that again? I'll be back in the back of the door. I, I wanted to get them in rubber bands and just hand them out to you, but I'll have to count them out. But I, I ask this morning that, uh, that we take them again. Father, we thank you for your word. Stand with me, folks. We thank you for your word this morning, the message that you've given us. Lord, that we need to live a life of love. We, we, we just need to be Christ-like. We need to be imitators of you and, and God you are you are all about love and so this morning we pray that you would use these cards may we see them as individuals that may may be lost and may be heading down a path that's not going to end well for them but Lord we pray over these cards right now that you would use them in our hands to reach out to other individuals, to make a difference in their lives, that they may come to the saving, sanctifying power of our Lord Jesus Christ through our witness, through our love to them. Help us, Lord, to be and to do that. In Christ's name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Shake hands with one.